makers and market movers. This is The Pulse with Francine Lacroix. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London with the conversations that matter. And here's what's coming up on today's program. Jay Powell says a March rate cut is unlikely, even though the tightening cycle has peaked. I don't think it's likely that the committee will reach a level of confidence by the time of the March meeting to identify March as the time to do that. But that's that's to be seen. Well, the Bank of England's next up with expectations of a cooler inflation forecast potentially opening the door to guidance on easing plus earnings in focus. BNP Paribas lumps as it cuts targets in fourth quarter profit falls. Deutsche Bank rises on planned cost reductions, which include 3,500 job cuts. So, so there's a lot going on today. Happy Thursday and frankly, good luck for the rest of the day. This is what the European markets map is showing right now. So you can see, uh, for example, the FTSE gaining some four tenths of eight percent. Now we had Shell one billion more in terms of earnings for the quarter. That was much better than expected. We've had a bit of a mixed bag when it comes to some of the earnings. Adidas and BNP Paribas under pressure. Uh, that's dragging the DAX lower two tenths of eight percent for Adidas. BNP Paribas, I think, down more than eight and a half percent. And that's putting a bit of pressure on the CAC 40 uh, down six tenths of 8%. The real focus, of course, is on exactly what happened, what we heard from Jay Powell, the fact that there was a pretty significant pushback against that March rate cut. What does that mean going forward? It's very clear that the next move is a cut, as expected. Is it not March? When is it? And again, there's a bit of repricing. Investors really looking through uh, what would also that is where that means for the ECB and the Bank of England, which is later today. And then finally, later on, we have a lot of big tech companies. Again, that will give us an indication on whether uh, the Wall Street rally was justified or not. Now, let's get more on the earnings. Let's get uh, straight to Justina Lee from Bloomberg. Justina, thank you for joining us. I mean, earnings, it's, it's kind of really a mixed bag. Some are great. Some are really bad. BNP Paribas down 8%. Yeah, exactly. And I think banks really are the focus today. I mean, with BNP, they were hit by, you know, the end of a payment from the ECB on their reserves and also legal provisions. So there's some issues kind of idiosyncratic to it. And then, you know, Deutsche Bank, on the other hand, was lifted by kind of expectations about shareholder payout. But I think a lot of people will be thinking about the fact that we're kind of in this shifting economic regime here where we're, you're not going to get that boost from kind of that high interest rate anymore. And at the same time, the, the European economy is possibly also slowing. And of course, we also got a string of bad news from U.S. banks overnight about their commercial real estate portfolio. And so you're kind of really seeing a lot of signs there that there may be more pressures on the banking sector. Um, just you know, very quickly, I mean, it, it doesn't seem, cost cuts don't seem to be at, at the upfront of, you know, chief executives minds like they were last time around. Yeah, I mean, that, that's kind of interesting. I think a lot of people are trying to see, you know, where consumer demand is going, where the economy is doing, going. I mean, interestingly, you know, today, like Adidas is slumping this morning, you know, because they're forecasting profits is going to be half of what analysts are expecting. Now, that's partly because of a currency hit, but I think that's kind of also making people think about, you know, demand from China, especially for kind of all these consumer goods. Justina, as always, thank you so much for joining us. Justina Lee there with some of the main earnings that we saw. Now, we're joined by Karen Ward, Chief Market Strategist, EMEA at JP Morgan Asset Management. And what a day <laughs> to come in because there's a lot going on. Mm. I wonder whether that, you know, the pushback from Jay Powell kind of changes everything. It does. I think what's really important is that the, what was so wonderful about December that we got from Jay Powell was the idea they were going to be preemptive rather than reactive. And that's really important for investors in risk markets because if they're going to be preemptive, they're going to see off any risks for us of slowing economic data, of slowing corporate earnings. So the market loved what he said in December. Yesterday's tone was a little bit more reactive. It was still waiting to see whether the economy really is slowing, whether that moderation in inflation is genuine and sustainable. So to me, I think that switch, the market did get carried away in December, um, and it was a reality check yesterday. And he was right to do so. I think he was right to be a little bit more hesitant. And, and Kerry, here's Jay Powell from yesterday. I don't think it's likely that the committee will reach a level of confidence by the time of the March meeting to identify March as the time to do that. But that's that's to be seen. Um, so I wouldn't call, uh, you know, when you say when you ask me about in the near term, right. I'm hearing that as March, I would say uh, I don't think that's it's probably not the most likely case or what we would call the base case. 
Um, Karen, is there going to be a bias, I guess, for most central banks that actually they, they just want to make sure that they don't have to reverse course? So, you know, if all things being equal, they'll probably cut a little bit later just to make sure that inflation is really down. I think they should. I think that's what they should be doing. I think, as you say, they've worked terribly hard to bring headline inflation down, to anchor their credibility. I think to move too early, we've seen historically that actually preemptively before you're absolutely sure that the underlying pressures and there's too much emphasis today on headline inflation yes headline inflation went up today to eight it may come down to one but we need to look through that what's the sustained underlying rate of inflation in the economy that's coming from the labor markets the labor markets are still pretty solid unemployment still record low in most places wage growth is moderating but not in a way that's consistent with two so i think they're absolutely right to take their time because the data are not crumbling. And in fact, what's happening, Francine, is with wage growth being a little bit sticky because the labor market's OK and headline inflation falling for what I would say are transitory factors, that's already a boost to the economy. And I think what you're going to see is consumer spending possibly reaccelerate. There's a stimulus coming without them intervening. So to wait and see how that whole narrative plays out, I think is the right thing to do. I mean, at the same time, so you have geopolitics. It, it just feels like a, f a funny six months that, that markets need to decide what will support valuations. I think that's right. Um, and as we get to the second half of the year, the political events, I think, are going to take precedent in terms of decision making. But I think this is just... You know, what I would say at the moment and certainly what I'm saying to clients is just don't be cute about our ability to do this. You know, the inflation data all over the show. What are the yeah. solid longer term themes? 4% on the US 10 year. These bond yields on high quality bonds. This is a good level. We know we're past peak. Lock that in. Stay quality focused across the spectrum because there's still a lot of uncertainty. Bank of England. I mean, mm. the governor can't really catch a break. There's a, there's a lot of pressure. He's getting criticized a lot for being behind the curve. Are they? <laughs> Well, the bank are just in a very different position to the Fed. I mean, the Fed, again, let's forget what's happening on headline inflation, because in both regions it's improving. But let's focus on what's happening in the labor market. The Fed have got 4% wage growth yeah. with 2% productivity. So there is not, you know, huge inflationary concerns coming from the labor market. We need to still monitor the Bank of England has got 6% wage growth and zero productivity. It's got a totally different configuration of underlying pressure. I think the real challenge to the Bank of England um, is how it sets out a framework today yeah. for guiding not just markets, but the public. Because, of course, if, in, if interest rates come, uh, if the inflation rate comes below two, the, the public's going to say, well, where am I? rate cuts coming. Um, but if it's not the right thing to do, so I think setting out a framework early doors where they say, look, we looked through 10% inflation. We didn't take rates up to double digits when inflation was 10 because headline inflation is not what we should focus on. We have a medium term target. And just in the same way, we'll be looking through any transitory downside. But they need to set out not forward guidance. That always gets them in yeah. trouble. But the framework... <laughs> I think, is what yeah. they need to set out today. But, Karen, how much of this inflation, actually, reduction is thanks to the central bank? I mean, is it almost impossible to quantify, or are they just lucky? And so then all of those rises will, are leading to what? So, again, it's, it's how do we abstract from the headline noise, yeah. which gets thrown around by energy, yeah. by supply shocks, and is still very much being thrown around by those factors, versus what are the really useful traffic-like indicators of whether the economy is over capacity. And that's where I think we're getting into the more service sector parts of the inflation basket. But to me, the anchor is the labor market. The labor market tells us whether we are truly hitting the buffers of our economy, whether we have no choice but to slow. So that's where I think the, the attention should be. I mean, there's, there's so many things that could pull markets. What do you, what's your kind of base case for the next three months? Inflation is still months? everything. Look, yeah. this whole rally that we've seen through the course of last year, but really intensified through the end of the year, is very much based on this idea that inflation is going to go away on its own accord without any need for slowing activity. That recession that was expected is no longer required. If inflation does prove sticky in those core metrics, mm -hmm. then I think that whole premise of the idea these economies don't have to slow, that crumbles, and that's where we're going to get you know, more of a reality check for risk markets. So 
Inflation is still everything. Um, Karen, I mean, there's a line of thoughts, especially for, for Europe and the UK, in saying, look, they're being crushed by the US. We don't know what happens with the, with the election. They're in between China. And this is probably the next two, three years where they get their act together, strengthen the supply chains, and actually have an energy policy. I mean, are you positive Europe, or are stocks, frankly, cheap for a reason? I am positive, actually, relative to expectations, yes. which is always the which critical thing. Yeah. And I think, I think particularly we underestimate the role of the establishment of the recovery fund, which a lot of that, those grants still haven't been dished out yet. And basically what's happened from the sovereign crisis to post-pandemic is Europe has now moved from a very sticks-based um, cohesion policy to a carrot-based cohesion policy. Um, and I think that really changes the political dynamic. Um, and I think also we'll see some of the fruits of that activity. Look, we just had a Q4 print. And who were the great performers? Spain and Italy. Who are getting the biggest grants from the recovery fund? Spain and Italy. So I still think the, the, the growth trajectory is going to improve. I think we are past the worst in Europe, actually. I think consumers got a bigger cost of living shock. That's fading. And therefore, we're going to see a little bit of consumer improvement. And we're going to have our fiscal boost in Europe this year, whereas the U.S. did it. The U.S. has spent their growth in fiscal and in pent-up consumer spending. Ours is still to come. So I think expectations are too low on Europe. And that record discount between Europe and the U.S., even when you make adjustments for the different sectoral composition of the benchmarks, now to me looks too low. So where do you want to be fully invested? If there, again, if markets are priced to perfection, how do, how do you actually play some of the themes that we've just discussed? I still think quality bonds is very high on, on my preference list at the moment because, you know, at these yields, we are past peak rates. That's something I, I feel I can say confidently. Yes, there's a question of timing, but you're now getting 4 to 5 percent on quality fixed income. I think that's very attractive. And then really using the dispersion within benchmarks and within regions, because that's where certainly even investors over a two to three year horizon, I think that's where you're going to see the biggest upside. So good. Karen, thank you so much okay. for joining us today. That was, of course, Karen Ward, Chief Market Strategist, EMEA at JP Morgan Asset Management. Now, much more to come. This is Bloomberg. Now, the Bank of England is likely to deliver a brighter outlook for the UK economy, reducing its forecast for inflation this year and potentially opening the way to interest rate reductions that could actually boost growth. Now, stay with us for the BOE decision when it happens. And for viewers in the UK, we'll also have a special coverage of the news conference. Later, we'll also bring our conversation with the BOE governor, Andrew Bailey. That's at 4 p.m. London time. Coming up, our exclusive interview with the Italian fashion billionaire who's behind labels such as Diesel and Maison Margiela. We'll talk luxury demand in China. And this is Bloomberg. Welcome back, everyone. Now, luxury stocks have mostly held their gains from the rally last week, triggered by robust sales at LVMH. Analysts now weighing up if the year ahead for the sector could more be positive than expected, despite inflationary pressures. Now, China, of course, remains a crucial market for European luxury. And my next guest opened a new shop in the country almost every week in 2023. Lorenzo Rosso is an Italian fashion billionaire and chairman of Only the Brave, OTB, the holding company that owns a range of brands such as Diesel Jeans, which he founded, Maison Margiela, and of course, Jill Sander. He joins me for an exclusive conversation. Renzo, so good to speak to you. Thank you so much for coming in. So Very happy to be here. You're, you're building this powerhouse of, of a lot of the brands. How are you seeing luxury demand going? But the luxury is uh, great. The luxury is fantastic. The luxury is uh, the most beautiful things in the fashion industry, you know. And the luxury also, I love luxury because uh, in luxury you have the margin for to run in uh, the, the, more, the modern brands today because in luxury, thanks to the margin, you can do a sustainable company that today is a very important uh, 
because the sustainability are uh, one of the most important things for the new consumer. If you are not a sustainable, you cannot be a brand for the future. But Renzo, I guess the concern is that some brands are doing very well, others not so well. So how do you create desirability? And is it the U.S. consumer? Is it the Asian consumer that is spending more? But, you know, fashion uh, is beautiful because uh, you have a possibility every six months uh, to prove that you are alive. Uh, and uh, I think uh, the brands that I represent uh, in, on, on my group, uh, you know, TV group, uh, Margiela, Gelsen, Marni and Diesel uh, are very special because uh, we're still really working with uh, the beauty of the product. And um, we are very proud because the industry is going, uh, the big industry is going in a different way. They try to be more uh, entertainment, uh, to be more uh, community. That's great because they generate a lot of business, a fantastic, uh, fantastic uh, business. But uh, I go exactly in the opposite way. I, I still thinking I love my consumers, so I think uh, uh, to protect them, I think uh, is uh, nice, uh, really working just uh, with the product and uh, give them uh, the possibility to choose what they like and not just because they are part of a community. So, Renzo, and, and I know you spend a lot of time also with artisans and trying to, you know, you care about the made in Italy, but are you, can you actually increase your prices? Or if you increase too much, does that hurt demand? Well, you know, prices are already very expensive, so uh, the, now the market is looking for uh, to to be a little bit safe uh, regarding the, the, the prices. Uh, even also the big brands, uh, I think they have to reduce the prices because they are too, too, too high. So the young consumer uh, can be very difficult for them uh, to, to uh, approach uh, to this uh, couple of these brands. Uh, and uh, what are we doing? We're working just uh, with, uh, in a simple way, cost plus the percentage uh, to run in the industry, and uh, we're doing the best that we can. But uh, we have to keep it... Uh, uh, alive uh, the brand uh, with uh, many things. Uh, special, uh, first of all, beauty, the beauty of the product. Uh, second uh, is the sustainability. Mm -hmm. And uh, we love uh, the, the way that we communicate because we are uh, much more uh, in, we are looking for uh, created dreams, created desire that uh, today is quite difficult to have in the fashion industry where, when you have everything. Mm -hmm. are, are you looking to IPO at some point? Yes, uh, how, uh, looking for because IPO can give me the possibility to run in mo even more transparency, but uh, for other reasons, for important reasons, also for, uh, for the new generation that is going to bring uh, the, my, my, my children, they're going to bring the companies. Uh, and also the third reason is that uh, for me, really, I love very much to have uh, all people working for me that they can be my partners. So, I mean, do you have any plans to, to IPO? Are you looking into that? Is it something that you're yeah, thinking we, about in Italy? Would you list in Italy? But I think uh, Milan can be the, the, the town because uh, I live in Italy, so it's uh, also a very important uh, town for uh, the luxury business. And uh, we work in uh, with uh, all my manager now for uh, because uh, to go to IPO is, is not easy. You need really to be very perfect. And uh, we're working uh, with my manager uh, in this direction. I hope uh, soon, uh, maybe next year, can be the time, okay, the right time to, to go. And then, so what do you want to do afterwards? Would you acquire more brands to become bigger? Well, we can acquire also now because, uh, thanks God, uh, uh, financially, uh, the, the position of our brands, uh, of, our, of our company are okay, so we can go into the market also now. But we don't want to buy just for buying because many brands are available now. Also, they are available for a very good price. Me, I just want uh, um, brands that the first can fit with the OTB group because we are very special. We are brave. We do special things. We really still work in a, in a beautiful product and not in a, just in celebrating you know, in, in a different way, like I told you before. And uh, so we're looking for... Um, Someone can be uh, l like, uh, like uh, with the characteristic that we are. And our creative director, you know, they are a rock star. We don't <laughs> have, uh, no, we, do, we don't have just a, just a, a design office, a design yeah, team yeah. Uh, like the big, uh, the big brands. Uh, I think we have uh, our creative director are really very, very super special. Yeah, and I've seen you, I mean, I've seen you walk a shop where you actually, you care about the details and you're in the details and you're in the minutia. So how, how would you pick the next brand? Is it what you, f you feel in the heart or is it more about the numbers? 
No, me, I love products. I come from the products uh, because I was born uh, in the product uh, and I work with uh, my creative director. So this is why we are uh, who we are. We are so special. Uh, and this is the way that I want to run my, my, my business, my brand. Uh, and also we have one characteristic that uh, are very special, that uh, we are incredibly loyal because uh, we, I believe in a circular economy. So we create, we produce, we deliver, we make money, but also we give back to the community a part of what we have created. This is a really part uh, of the education that I received from my parents. Um, our foundation is really very deeply involved uh, to solve problems, to helping people, uh, people that uh, are, uh, have a, a, are not uh, uh, are more problem yeah. that we have. <laughs> interesting. So interesting. Renzo, thank you so much. I hope this is one of many interviews here in the okay. studio. Renzo, so also there, the president and founder of OTB. Coming up, but we'll hear from the former Bank of England MPC member ahead of the monetary policy decision. This is Bloomberg.